A number of years ago, I went to India. And when I was there, one of the clearest things that you're told and you try to prepare for is just how dirty things are. They just don't have the roads that are sealed as wide as ours. Uh, they don't have the grass verges or the footpaths paved like what we have. And so there's just dust and grime everywhere. The buildings look dirty. Uh, when you wake up, there's like a, a film of dust on the floor. It just feels like everywhere is dirty. And rubbish is everywhere. When you look around the streets, there's rubbish on the floor. Whenever you drive past uh, like a, a channel, a uh, creek, you just see it piled up with dirt and litter. It's just this sense of rubbish everywhere. And they have cows on their streets walking around and, and of course, so there's dung in places as well. It's just a dirty feel of the whole country. As well as that, there's just crazy things happening. You feel as though you take your life into your hands every time you head out the front door. And so it's so different from our culture. We see this change from what we have to what they have. And it's easy to see the clear differences. Or think about the, the environment that we're living in now, the changes that we've been through, the radical change in hygiene and the, the ways that we live is so different with our social distancing of 1.5 meters. It's like people have changed from who they were six months ago to now. The way we do things have changed. Some of our attitudes and our thoughts have changed. And that leads to that change, uh, changing who we are and the way we go about things. You know, at the shopping line, in the past, you might not have told someone to stay back if they're getting too close to you. Now you're like, 1.5 meters, you've got to be back the distance. And you can just imagine how that changes everything about who we are because of these changes. Well, today we're going to be talking in Luke chapter 6 about a change that Jesus has called us to. And we ask the question of, is, are the values that Jesus has put for us the same as our values? Are we lining up our lives with Jesus' values? Are we holding on to the things that we value and aren't really important to Jesus' kingdom? Now, this sermon that Jesus preached in Luke chapter 6 is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount passage that we find in the book of Matthew. Now, when you look at these two next to each other, they're not the same. They're similar. There are some clear similarities. And oftentimes people will say, oh, that's just Luke. He's heard the same story and written it up in a shorter form. But I think it's actually that as a preacher, if Something has worked really well. You know, if I've preached a message at Kruger and people have laughed or there's been an illustration that worked really well, then I'll use that same sermon or similar to it at another church that I'm asked to preach at. I know, shocking to think that I would do such a thing, but it's true. You want to use the best message in a place where you go and visit. And it seems as though Jesus had some best messages that he preached on a number of occasions so that he could put forward a key point in his kingdom. Now, it's probably not that Jesus was just getting killer laughs or had a great illustration that went really well or, or had a great response. Instead, it seems to be these key concerns Jesus has of the value statements of the kingdom that he wanted to put across in a number of places that he went around and spoke to. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be opening up to Luke chapter 6. And we're going to have a look at what Jesus had to say to his disciples. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how the ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you who will mourn and weep. Woe to you whenever anyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Man, this is not really a palatable kind of passage. This is not one that you would think, man, Jesus, that sermon killed. You should definitely do that the next town we come to. 
It's probably more one of those passages that you hear and you say, uh, Jesus, I don't think that's going to be too popular. I think you should back off that kind of rhetoric because what you're saying doesn't really fit all that well. And, and even when we hear this, when we go through this, we're kind of going through and scratching our heads and saying, blessed are people who are poor, who are hungry, who weep and who, who are hated. How can they possibly be blessed? How can that possibly be something that someone in God's kingdom would desire and want after? And this is where the the concerns come with us. We start asking these questions. What is Jesus talking about? Well, the word blessed in the uh, original context means that you are favored. You are approved by God. It was something you wanted to be, to be blessed. Actually, it's, it's also something to say that there is a hope for you. If you are blessed, there is a hope for your future. There is something that you are holding on to that is not just something that you've created, but it's something that God has given you. God has given you his blessing. And the woe, well, they're really like uh, sad. It's like you would say to someone, oh man, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that about you. I'm, I'm sorry to hear uh, that about your life. But when we put these together, we, we, we start going, well, what is this? Should we aim to be poor? Should we aim to, to be persecuted, to be hungry, to, to weep and mourn? Is that something that our lives should be aiming towards? That doesn't seem right. Should we be running away from riches and well-fed? How do we hold this intention? How do we understand what Jesus has to say here? Because it seems as though Jesus is asking us to do something that in other places, there seems to be some conflict. There seems to be some misunderstanding. So we need to understand the context of this. We need to understand what Jesus is saying. Now, clearly, there is a parallel. There is a blessing and a woe that go hand in hand. So there is a blessed are those who are poor, but woe to those who are rich. Blessed are those who are hungry, but woe to you who are well fed. Blessed are you who weep, but woe those who laugh now. Blessed are you who get persecuted for what they believe in, but woe to you when everyone speaks well to you. So this is an ancient Near East kind of parallelism. They have one point that later in the passage, the opposite is said. So there's biblical language that comes in here and an understanding that this text is 2000 years old. And if we don't understand it, actually, if there are things you don't understand in the Bible, I think the first thing we should be drawn to is to say, well, if we believe that God is good and he loves us, he wants good things for us, then what could this possibly mean? There's a potential that with 2,000 years of distance, with a different culture and context that we're reading into, maybe there's something that I need to dig a little bit deeper into to be able to understand this passage. And you'll be glad to find there is. But don't be too glad because there's still an incredible challenge in here for all of us to be able to understand. So firstly, we need to look at and say, well, what's the context? Who is Jesus talking to in the midst of this? Well, what was happening was that Jesus was traveling with his companions, his disciples. He had just called his disciples. And so he had this group of people who were following him. And then at this certain time, he specifically chose 12. Now, it it seems that he was up on a mountainside. He had his, his followers with him. And then he went and he identified 12 people. And it was kind of like a, you know, an old schoolyard pick. He went around and went, Simon, Andrew, James, um, I think I'm going to have John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the other Simon, the zealot, and good Judas will have you. And then he's looking around and he's going, oh, who else could we have? Um, uh, who else is around? Is, is Paul? No, Paul's not here. Uh, is, there, is there another Matthew? We know Matthews are all good. Uh, uh, and there's bad Judas. He's like, me, me, pick me, pick me. And Jesus finally turns and goes, oh, okay, bad Judas. You can be involved in my 12 too because you can't have 11 disciples. 12 just is a better fit. You can go out by two by two, it, you know, a dozen. Uh, it, it fits really well. And so Jesus chose his 12 disciples and then he came down from the mountainside and people heard that Jesus was healing. He, he started to heal people. And, and so 
People came from far and wide. They, they heard about Jesus' healing and they got excited, interested in this. And I think it's a time where it's not like you can go to a local hospital and receive fantastic health care. It's not like your options were plentiful when it came to that care. Actually, it was a time where healthcare was very minimal and costly. And so people would have had to go f- from a long distance away. And then hearing that, that Jesus was giving this away for free, wow, people would have come from far and wide to Jesus to be healed. And it says that Jesus was, was healing people of physical and spiritual ailments. Uh, people were listening to what he had to say. Now, the disciples, they were just, you know, knighted disciples, the top 12. They were seeing all of this. And then it says, Jesus turned to them and spoke. I wonder what they were thinking. They've just been anointed. They come down and they see Jesus doing amazing things. Maybe, just maybe, they had in mind where this was headed. Maybe they had in mind who Jesus was about to be. Maybe they were thinking, oh, Jesus, you can heal that here in the wilderness. We're getting these poor people. They're thanking us with loaves of bread and stinking fish. Man, we we want to take this to the city. Let's go to Jerusalem. Come on, Jesus. Let's go to where the real crowds are. Not just the the out-of-towners, not just the the distant, those people who are are sick and are are crawling here. We, We don't want to hang out with the lepers. Jesus, let's go to Jerusalem, the capital city. Let's go where we can be seen and known and heard, where people with real wealth, can come and the influences, they can hear what you have to say. Jesus, uh, we can see this going to Athens. Jesus, this could go all the way to Rome. You're going to be so popular. This is going to be awesome. And we're here right alongside of you, Jesus. And then Jesus says, Blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who hate you when you're persecuted because of righteousness. I think Jesus was actually looking around at the people that were surrounding them, the thousands of people who were flocking because they were desperate to hear from Jesus. They were desperate for healing. They were desperate to hear from him and their lives were being changed. I mean, think about those times in our lives where we've changed from being perhaps someone who wasn't a follower of Jesus to being a follower of Jesus. But perhaps it was we've changed in our heart in some way, where we've been challenged about something, where things didn't go the way we wanted, when we've been hurt and injured, uh, when we've had a loved one that we so desperately wanted to get well. Aren't they the times that we start to pray more deeply and, and, and longer and harder Aren't there those times where we need comfort? Aren't there those times that we call upon God in our need and our distress and he answers us and he he comes and he changes our heart because we come to know him in a deeper way through the trials than we do through the joy? Those times that we want to share our faith, but we've been rejected and we go to God and we say, what was wrong? What happened? I did what I was asked. I I did what I needed to do. And, And we cry out to God. I think Jesus in the midst of this was saying, hey guys, look around you. This is the kingdom. The poor are getting fed. The the ill, the sick are being healed. Lives are changing. Spirits are being turned to the new kingdom. You've got your mind and your way set on the things of this world, but I'm here to tell you that there is a new kingdom that I want to bring in, and that kingdom is going to impact everyone in the world. But those who are going to want it are those who are poor and hungry and persecuted and mourning. They're the people who are ready. The other people in the cities who've got everything and life is going well, you know, maybe one or two, maybe sometimes they'll come to know me. But the real fruit comes when we're in the depth of our need. The real fruit comes when we are desperate, when we're at the bottom and we reach up to God and say, God, help me. That's what Jesus was driving them towards. He wasn't saying, 
Give away all your money, become poor. Because that just means that we're dependent on other people. He doesn't say, you know, embrace hunger, stop eating the the worst diet ever. Because that just means that we go around grinding and we're upset. He he doesn't say, hope that someone around you will die so that you will mourn. He he doesn't say, just be a mean person so everyone hates you. Or or be so judgmental as a Christian that, that everyone hates you. These things that Jesus is driving us towards, he's saying that in the moment that we're persecuted, where we're weeping, we're hungry and we're poor, in those places, there's a blessedness that can come. There's a hope that can come. There's a sense of God's presence that can be given to us that's outside of this world, that looks towards a kingdom to come rather than those who are rich, well-fed, laughing, and everyone speaks well of you. They're the people who, in the midst of life, uh, are living for today, enjoying the now, but oftentimes have no care and no concern for the future. Jesus is speaking here about values, the values of the kingdom, that we need to be dependent on God, and the place where we're most dependent on him is where when we're at our lowest. Sure, we can shift our dependency and, and we hope and we pray that we do shift our dependency when we, when we are going well, when life is going good. But, but those times where we seem to jump the most are those times where we're at our least. And we need to grapple with this because it's so easy to be able to imagine our lives living for the 21st century Australian dream values rather than the kingdom values of Jesus, the one we call our Lord. If we call him Lord, then that means that he is the one that sets the values. He's the one that sets the direction. He's the one we're following, not our own lives, not who we are. My daughter Michaela and I have been watching a a Michael Jordan uh, series uh, over this last week. And it was amazing seeing this guy who who was the most popular person on planet Earth throughout the 90s. It's amazing to think before the era of social media, uh, while basketball was just kind of a growing sport, that this one man made such an impact worldwide. He was such a a known name around the world and, and really brought basketball into the homes of many families Uh, really raised the profile of the Chicago Bulls uh, that in a lot of ways uh, helped Nike to grow to be a a, a worldwide brand name today. There's so much success that went along with his life and the the trophies that he won and the most valuable player. He was a good looking guy. He, He was so positive. He never said anything about politics or religion. He stayed out of those camps because he didn't want to make anyone upset. And as I was watching Watching this, it just made me think about this passage and think, here is a guy that by the world's standards has everything. But Jesus would say, woe to you. Now, I don't know about Michael Jordan's faith and and the connection he has with God. I'm not judging that. I'm just saying that it's so easy to be enamored by the things of this world, the things of the now. But Jesus is calling us to care for those people who are lowest in our world because they're the people who are going to be with in the kingdom to come. Jesus is calling us to care for the poor, to care for the hungry, to go out of our way to love and care for those who are weeping and mourning and to care for those who are most persecuted in our world. They're the ones that we are to have a heart for, to connect with. They're the ones we're to go out of our way to engage with and love. And when we do that, we become people of the kingdom. We shift our lives. We change our values to be able to care for what Jesus cares for most. Things that are eternal, not just things that are here for today. And I find that a challenge. I find that really difficult. That's a mindset I have to keep reminding myself of that my focus should not be on this world and the victories and the championships and the great people But actually, those things are just fading. They're just here for a moment. What is eternal is what happens spiritually within us. 
those whose lives are transformed by the gospel and come to know Jesus, those who recognize that he lived amongst us and was hungry, who he was poor, he, he had no house or place to lay his head, he, he, he even died and was buried in a borrowed tomb. He gave up everything for us. He sacrificed even his life. When we look at persecution for his beliefs, he was martyred for what he believed. And ultimately, he believed that in his death, we might have life. And so my encouragement as we read this and try to grapple with these blessings and woes, this upside down kingdom that Jesus brings to us, my challenge is to think, how are we grappling with this? How are we attaching our lives, not to this world, but to the world to come? And to the Jesus who came and lived amongst us as an example of the amazing future kingdom that we are welcomed into as we give our lives over to him and put first his values that he would want for us. That's my prayer for you, that you might be challenged by Jesus's words to look at your life and to consider how you are to live in the values of Jesus's kingdom. Let's pray. And so, Jesus, we are so grateful that you would invite us into this upside down kingdom that is so different from what this world would say is valuable and good. And yet in the midst of life, you show us that ultimately your way is the best. Your way brings us a hope and a security for the future. Your way brings us a blessing that is above and beyond anything we could ever imagine. We want to live a life free of woes and full of blessing. And so I pray you might challenge our hearts to grapple with this text, to grapple with what it means to be blessed in your kingdom, and that we might change our lives, love those who are poor, hungry, mourning, and needy. Go out of our way to find ways to help those who are persecuted so that we might be aligning our lives with yours. We pray this, Jesus, in your holy and mighty name. Amen.